Well, welcome to Hope Church. We are so excited that you are with us today as uh, we are continuing really wrapping up this series of everyday habits and really understanding what it means to uh, really take these big, uh, these small steps that lead to big changes within our life. Well, the purpose and the reason that I'm up, up, I'm up front today is I'm, I'm not speaking, but I want to share with you, uh, there was a challenge that I gave us as a congregation uh, just a couple of weeks ago as we were ending the year end project, and I just want to bring to you where we ended, uh, and you know, God was just so good. Uh, you actually did what I challenged you, and that was to open your pocketbooks and to pray and just really uh, trust what God was asking you to do. So if you remember, we were $30,000 short of our goal. Goal was 105, so I just want to let you know, I mean, we superseded it, so let's celebrate. Yes. You know, one of the things that is just so humbling is to be able to stand in front of a congregation that I have really grown to love and to recognize and realize that your obedience just continues to humble me. Your obedience to Christ and to, to what he is calling us to do as a church just humbles me. I had the opportunity this last week to be with uh, several of the largest churches, the pastors in uh, the missionary denomination, and to be able to celebrate with them what God is doing here at Hope Church is just nothing more than just humbling, because God is on the move here, and uh, he, is just, he just continues to open doors for us. Lives are being transformed. We uh, see people who are taking steps of obedience, and you are a part of it, and I am so thankful uh, to be a part of this church, uh, Hope Missionary Church. Oh, it's so it's such a privilege to be able to be up here. Uh, like Mark said, thank you for your gratitude. Thank you for the chance we have to to be here to sh to share. And thank you for um, your your humility, your willing hearts, your and your gratitude. I mean, it's such it's it's awesome to serve as a pastor here. I just want to say that. So we're we're wrapping up. Start small. We're, we're six weeks into 2024, and, and maybe I don't need to ask, but six weeks in, you know, is there some, if any of you guys have found a good rhythm, a good, a good habit, a resolution that you've stuck with? Is there anybody that's stuck with it for six weeks so far? I see maybe one or two hands. Well, good job. Now, what, what about, maybe this one will be a better response. How, how many of you haven't even thought about that thing? If you made a resolution or you had a plan for 2024, how many of you haven't even thought about it in about a month at least? That's kind of where I am too. You know, it's been, it's been a good while. You know, it, it's, it's amazing how quickly some of, some of those things, it can, it can turn from the attitude of, well, I'm going to start this today. I'm going to start this today. And then, then it switches to, you know, I think I'm going to try that tomorrow. And then pretty quickly it can turn from that to, you know, that'd be nice to do someday. Someday down the road, that'd be nice to add that in. You know, I, I think the hard part about any new habit is it's not, it's not automatic. It can be simple, but it can be really, really difficult to put into practice. You know, and there, there are some books out there uh, that just they make it seem like it's about the easiest thing to do. We have, well, the 21-day weight loss kickstart. Man, it's just that simple. 21 days, you're on your way. There's a three-week miracle. That's all it takes, three weeks. There's two weeks to self-love. There's have a new kid by Friday. You know... I'll say there's some good principles in that book, but they didn't stop there either. They went to have a new teenager by Friday. And they said, have a new you by Friday. They thought, we got something good here. We got we to gotta keep riding this to, to take it to the bank. And they came through. And my favorite, my favorite is 21 Easy Days to a New and Improved You. And that's half the title. Or 42 Easier Days to a Slightly New and Mildly Improved You. 
that's not that bad. Six weeks and I, just a little bit of change, that's not bad. You know, there can, there can be good principles, there can be good practices found in those books, but it, it tends to take far, far longer than one, two, or even three weeks for a habit to stick. You know, in fact, a 2009 study on habit creation found that habits developed in a range of 18 days on the short end to 254 days on the long end. And the participants in that study, they reported it took an average of 66 days to reliably incorporate one of these three habits. It was eating a piece of fruit at lunch, drinking a bottle of water with lunch, or running for 15 minutes before dinner. 66 days to regularly, reliably incorporate just one of those three. Now, I mean, the running one's a little harder than the other two, let's be honest. But to, to 66 day average to incorporate a bottle of water or a piece of fruit with lunch every day. I mean, the reality is, even small habits, they take time. But those small habits can also have a profound impact in the long term, too. You know, as we, as we wrap up today, I've got a question for us with this. It's what are those small steps, what are those small habits we can begin to instill in our lives that will put us on the trajectory toward lasting results? Or if we want to frame that specifically within our relationship with Jesus, what are those small everyday habits that will lead to a rich, life-giving faith? As I thought about this topic, as I prayed about where to go, there was one passage that kept coming to mind, and it was Deuteronomy 6. And to give a little background here on this book, the book of Deuteronomy, it's, it's a speech, it's a covenant renewal ceremony by Moses to the people of Israel as they're on the cusp of entering the promised land. After 40 years of wandering the desert because of the unbelief of the previous generation, this new generation of Israelites is primed. And they're ready to go in. They're ready to enter in. And so Moses is now speaking to this new generation. That he's reminding them of who God is, of who they are, and of how God has called them to live. Who they're called to be. So let's dive in. We'll start at verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. We'll stop there for a second. That's a big statement. That's a grand idea. That's something we want to be true about us. We, we say things like that, but, but the question is, well, how do we do that? You know, we, we, can, we can have these, and we can sing these too, these huge overarching statements of how we should love God and how we should live if we belong to him. But then we can feel lost because we're really not sure how to put that into practice. How do we put that into action in real everyday life? It can be like, like a farmhouse wall saying. You know, it can be this, this grand, this great idea, this wonderful sentiment, but standing on its own, it can lack practical application. We got a good one here. I mean, I love this one. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. It's a fantastic statement. It's something I want to be true of me and my family that we would serve the Lord. I 100% agree with that. But what does that look like in everyday terms? It's one thing to say. It's one thing to say something big and broad, but to break it down in real life, it starts to get really, really hard. Well, thankfully, as we keep reading Deuteronomy 6, it doesn't stop with just verses 4 and 5. Instead, Moses is making a big statement, and he carries on with a practical application. So in verse 6, he continues, it says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. Instead, Moses isn't just making this big, grand statement and letting them figure it out on their own. He's putting this practical application right on that. He's not wanting God to become out of sight 
out of mind. He's encouraging, the, the, he's encouraging Israel to have these small, these everyday habits that will point them back to God. You know, and there were some that interpreted this in a very literal way. And they developed, they developed a practice of actually binding God's word on their, to their hearts and even their minds. And, and from that, we get probably what is one of my favorite words, not in the Bible, but, but kind of from Bible tradition. That's, they're called phylacteries. And they're these little boxes that have scripture, they have verses from the Torah inside of them. And they have leather straps there too. And individuals can wrap those around and hold it right on their forehead and bind it to their arm so it's right here on their arm and next to their heart too as a very physical, a very real reminder to obey God, to obey his word. And they set these reminders before them. And I'm not saying we should specifically do this habit, but this, a practice like this where we create something that's every day, this small habit instilled into daily life. We need those to point to the reality of, well, who we are. They need it to point to the reality of who they are, whose they are, and who they're called to be too. And that idea has staying power for sure. In fact, Deuteronomy 6, it points us to a truth that, that connects with our lives. And, and that's that everyday habits lead to tangible, lasting results. Sometimes... Sometimes a change in rhythm can, hap can happen suddenly, but oftentimes it takes time. It takes us time to grow into that change, to grow into that new rhythm. And, and on this, I think of my dad. And when, I was a t when he was a teenager, he picked up the habit of smoking menthol cigarettes. And, you know, and it, it, wasn't com it wasn't uncommon at the time. It was pretty normal. And... You know, he picked up that bad habit, and then for at least the next dozen plus years, he struggled with that addiction, being addicted to cigarettes, until it very quickly had real-life implications. Because as a four-year-old, I was diagnosed with asthma. And now suddenly, smoking wasn't just a bad habit that, would have, that could have down-the-road health implications for him. It had very real life implications for his child too. So he had that extra motivation to do something different. And so he quit. And I mean, four-year-old me, that's, that's all I know of the story. I don't, I don't know the struggle that went into to how that quitting looked like. I don't know, I don't know the, the sleepless nights or the, or the wrestling that went through or just the, the withdrawal that could be there from nicotine that he went through. I didn't I was there, but it didn't register with me. And I think he probably did a pretty good job of trying to hide that. But, but one thing I do remember was the smell of a new habit he picked up in place of that. Because what he did instead of smoking menthol cigarettes for the rest of his life, he picked up the simple practice of popping Hall's menthol cough drops every single day. And so that was, that, was one of my, that was one of the lasting memories of my dad is before he'd leave, so he was a school teacher, before he'd leave for work, he'd reach on top of the fridge, and he had his little change jar there, and in the change jar too, there were all these Hall's menthol cough drops, and he'd take a few Hall's cough drops with him, he'd pop one in, so my dad always smelled like cough drops. You know, it was a small habit, but that small everyday shift, it made a dramatic long-term shift for his health and well-being and for, for my health and well-being too. And the rest of our family as well. You know, when he, when he moved from that big idea, this big simple idea of I want to quit smoking. When he moved from that grand idea into everyday life. He had the motivation and then he added the practical steps toward lasting change. You know, we can be, we can be experts on that big idea of Deuteronomy 6.5. Saying things like, I want to follow Jesus with my whole life. We can say, Lord, I'm yours. I commit myself to you. And those, those are important things to say. I'm not saying don't say that. But without tangible habits, without something in everyday life, the likelihood that those real and heartfelt sentiments never gain traction and they turn into empty words, well, that's probably what it's going to be. 
They'll turn into this resentment and this regret of what could have been instead of a life that's fully surrendered to Jesus because we never took the practical steps along the way to actually surrender to him. And those reminders, well, they don't have value in and of themselves either. They're not the main thing, but they point us to the main thing. Those small habits, they're reminders that point us to something bigger. You know, I think they, they have value not because of what or who they are, but, but they have value because of who they reset our attention to. I think of a wedding ring as some, some little example. You know, by itself, it's just a ring. It's just a thing. Some can be worth a lot of money. Anyone can buy one. It doesn't have, you don't have to sign a paper that you're going to get married to get a wedding ring. You can just get a very nice ring. The one I have on, well, this one wasn't the one that my wife put on my finger when we got married. This is one because it's functional. It's silicone ring. And it's more when I'm working in the garage, when I'm working out. It's a very functional and practical purpose. And by itself... Well, it's, it's not worth much of anything. It was probably just a couple of bucks. You know, it doesn't have that intrinsic value because of the, the cost to purchase it. But to me, it's priceless. You know, not because of what this ring is on its own, but because of what and who it points to, what, who and what it represents. It's a statement that I belong to Rhonda. It's a statement and a reminder of the commitment I made to her, of the vows we took. It's a reminder that there's someone that, that's counting on me. And it becomes a big deal because of who it points me to. And that's what the value of these everyday reminders, that's what the, the value they have. It's found not in what they are, but in who they point us to. So what habit, what, what small habit of the heart can you place in your daily life that in small ways it can start to reorient your mindset, reset your eyes, reset your focus onto Jesus. You know, I have a, I have a friend who sets an alarm for 10.02 every morning. He sets it for 10.02 every morning to remind him to pray Luke 10.2. Luke 10.2 reads, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. That alarm, it resets his focus from whatever he's doing, whatever he's about in that moment, and puts it squarely back onto God's desire that all people and all nations would come to know him. It reminds him to pray. I've got another friend, I mean, on, those, on that same theme, I've got another friend that sets an alarm to go off as a reminder to pray. If they, someone's told them they have a specific meeting, they've got an appointment, they've got a surgery, they have something specific coming up. And so he says, you know, I, I don't want to forget to pray for him when that thing comes up, so I'm going to set a reminder on my phone to go off then. And I, I don't think he would call it a habit of intercessory prayer, but that's exactly what it is. He's reminding himself in that moment to step in and to pray on behalf of that person to take that request to God. And that's a big deal. Maybe, maybe your habit could be a rubber band. You know, maybe it could be a reminder that you're God's, that you're loved by him. It could be a bracelet instead of something like a rubber band, or it could be it could even be a reminder in itself of a habit, of an action you're trying to instill or something you're trying to stop. It could be that simple reminder like that. Journaling can be an incredible habit, too, to reflect on where God is showing up, to pray each and every day through that, and then to look back and to see what God has done and to see how God has been faithful. Spending time in God's word is obviously Another one, getting into your Bible and studying. And I'm working through with a group of guys on Wednesday nights, the book of Ephesians. We're having an awesome time in that class. And I've, I've been so enriched getting to be there and be part of that discussion too. But on the first night, I told them, you know, there's going to be times when you dive into God's word, when you get into your Bible, and they are so life-giving. That there are going to be times where it's like the words jump off the page and connect right to your heart. But there are also going to be times where you can read and you can feel like you're just going through the motions. You read and you're, you're not sure in the moment how that really resonates. Said, But even if that's the case, the important part in the long run 
is getting back to God's word time and time again. It's putting in the reps. It's developing that habit. And that habit in the long run of seeking out God through his word, it's going to pay off immensely as you just grow in an understanding of who he is, of who he's called you to be, of what he's like. That happens over time. It doesn't happen in an instant. Or maybe that habit's not something to add. Maybe it's something to to cut away. Maybe it's something to stop. Something to cut out to create space for silence. Maybe it's something to cut out to create space for Sabbath, to truly rest and not always be on the go, go, go. We're also getting ready to step into this season of the church we've traditionally celebrated as Lent. You know, and, and I, my church didn't really celebrate Lent that much growing up. All I knew was my Catholic friends, suddenly they gave up chocolate or they had, they had to eat fish on Friday. They had to do these different things. And I wasn't sure what it was about. But as I got to see and got to discover what Lent was truly about, I learned that it's a season it's intended to be a season of prayer and fasting, of turning our eyes daily onto Jesus, of turning our rhythms daily onto Jesus. It's preparing for Good Friday, preparing for the, when Jesus was crucified, and preparing for Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection. What if, what if you decide to fast in a small way? It could, be, it could be that cutting out chocolate, it could be social media, it could be from TV, it could be from your, from your phone. What if, maybe, maybe it could be one meal a week. Maybe it could be a practice, like to call now, it's a health, it can be a health fad of intermittent fasting. But what if you took to some way fasting from something between now and Easter? And it's, it's not just about the fasting, though. It's not just about what you're cutting out. It's about when you're longing for that thing, when you want that thing. That's a moment to turn your attention to Jesus and to rely on him. It's an opportunity to look to him instead of indulging in what your mind or your body wants. So we're, we're six weeks into 2024. Maybe you're no closer to a, something new you wanted to add than when January 1st rolled around. But we're also seven weeks from now till Easter Sunday. And I know as we talk about habits, I I said at the beginning, well, there's a 66-day average. And I know that 49 is not the same as 66, but 49, it's starting to get pretty doggone close to 66. So what if for the next seven weeks, what would life look like if for the next seven weeks you committed daily to incorporating one new Simple, small thing that turned your attention back to God. What would be different? How would life be changed between now and then? Because in one small way, you've been shifting everything back to God. I bet it would be a big deal and a big difference in the long run. At the bottom of your notes sheet, there's there's a spot under the heading of the next seven weeks. And it says, between now and Easter... I will seek to grow closer to Jesus through the small habit of blank. Well, I'd encourage you to, to write down at some point today one simple small practice that you'll instill or you'll make more regular in your life as a means to growing closer to Jesus. Try a small practice. Try even a small sacrifice, even fasting for one thing between now and Easter. Try it for the next 49 days. And watch it grow into a lasting habit that fosters a rich and deeper and life-giving faith in Jesus. Let's pray, church. Lord, thank you. Thank you for how you are the one who never abandons us. Thank you for being the God who is faithful, for being the God who is present. Lord, As we look into what to add to step closer to you, it's not something we do on our own strength. It's not something we do in our own ability. It's something we're relying on you for. But, Lord, as we look to Easter Sunday, as we look to these next seven weeks, Lord, how can we grow closer to you? What's a small way 
that we can step deeper into relationship with you. And Lord, we know and we trust that you're the one that's going to give us the strength to make it happen. Thank you for being the faithful one and for being present in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.